All right, well, now I've just got to get myself organized here. We've got quite a lot going on up here today. Um, and, you know, all right, I'll come to these little fellas later. You can sit there and watch that. Still got my knitting handy. I want when I teach the Bible, when we teach God's word, I want you to be looking each Sunday for something that God wants to say to you. You don't, the idea when we listen to a, a sermon is not that you try and remember it all. That's not the point. The point is that you listen for the voice of the Spirit and what he's saying to you. What, what is the one or two things that you want to take away that God is wanting to stir in your heart, inside you? Um, we're in a series of messages where we're teaching the essential message of a book of the Bible every week. Uh, and today's book is Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians because it answers some really important questions. Why the church? Why the church? What exactly is the church? Can I just be a follower of Jesus on my own? Have you wondered that? And more importantly, how can churches stay healthy and happy together and alive? They're great questions. And this book of Ephesians, and I hope today's message, will help solve or answer some of those questions. I want to read, first of all, God's word to us this morning, some selected verses from chapter 5 and 6 of this wonderful book of Scripture called Ephesians. Listen to the word of God. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord... Beg you, lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God, you, all of you, not you, all of you, called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Isn't that good? Okay. Speak the truth in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. You, you, you non-musicianal people, <laughs> you know, people go out there, oh, I, can't do, I can't do music. You, you're to make a music offering inside your heart to God. You, you can do music. It's a symphony of praise to Father God, to the Father. Okay, there's a few key verses and some of the things I want to share this morning will come around those verses. Chapter four, chapter five. Well, here we are, if Ephesus. Um, some years ago, Judy and I were in Ephesus. Here we are, okay? Main Street, Ephesus, walking down. I think today it's called Kudasi, if you go on a Mediterranean ship or somewhere around the Mediterranean, you may well go into Kudasi, which is Ephesus, the city of Eph Eph Main Street. There we are walking down. And, um, you know, you, you probably wouldn't realize it, but Ephesus used to be a seaport uh, in Asia Minor. Um, and today it's 10 kilometers inland. To give you an idea of what that might be like, if you go to the city of Tauranga and you drive down the main road right through from the city, from right from the port, and you end up in Greerton, all right, Greerton would have been a seaport, <laughs> okay? So Greerton or Ohauiti would have been where the ships tied up in Tauranga. And that used to be the place in Ephesus. Today, it's all silted up, and you drive right up to the city of Ephesus today. Excavation is still taking place on the side of Main Street, um, which showed how these people lived. Homes with fresh running water, irrigation, 
and intricate decor. Uh, there's some photos that we took when we walked up and down the main street and up onto the side where the excavation to these days is still taking place. And what these guys do, look at what they do, okay? These are jigsaw pieces of the puzzle of the intricate decor on the walls and they've kind of try and piece them together like a jigsaw to figure out what it looked like. Well, it was to these believers that Paul wrote. He was chained to a Roman guard in prison. And uh, this morning I want to talk about what is this thing we call church? Is church what we're doing today? Is it the building on Charlemont Street, which has got kind of orange roof tiles that you drive past? Look on the road. By the way, Judy said this morning, and I know there'll be a good answer to it, why is there no entrance off Main Street into the church? You've got to come, I don't know. Someone tell me later. Um, but, you know, you've got to come round the back to come in here, don't you? But is that the church, the, 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 the orange building? Uh, or is the church an organization worldwide led by the Pope who wears funny clothes? Is the church what the media portray, uh, a place for old women and children, and its leaders are effeminate men who can't get employment in the real world? Oh, that's cruel. <laughs> you have a look the next time the church makes it onto TV, and who they interview, okay? I won't say any more. Uh, but, you know, there's, a, there's a, a whole agenda out there to project the church in a particular way. Uh, is the church a slick business operation governed by a hierarchical precision of leaders? Or is the church a stay-at-home, watch TV presenter, preacher, and try and pry money out of your wallet in return for health, wealth, and happiness? You know that kind of church, don't you? It's there, very easily available. Ephesians tells us the church is none of these. None of these. And so this morning, in part one of my message, I want to tell you three things from the book of Ephesians, the church is. The church is a gathered community who declare Jesus as the risen Christ. In chapter one and two, Paul many times uses the word, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. And there's several ways that he describes this. Now, this morning, I want to um, use this. Uh, here we go. The question to you today, one of the questions, is the water in the sponge or is the sponge in the water? And surely the answer is both. You are in Christ. There, there's a, a kind of an illustration here that, that when Christ is in you, you are also in him and in the world and he lives in you. And he is in this world as well. And you are in Christ and you have a particular identity in that. And I'll talk about that later. Later on I'm going to use the same illustration to talk about being filled with the Spirit. But the most significant about the church is not its buildings or its budgets, but people connected to God through Christ. He is in you. And he is alive in you. And his life is alive in you. And later on we'll talk about why that needs to be significant by the Spirit of God. Peter Foster reminded us last week, being free from the law and the rules and connected to God through Christ. That's the only reason that is the real reason why church exists today. We exist so we are a gathered community to declare the risen Christ. Chapter 1 talks about how this is worked out um, in our lives. We are chosen. We are selected. We are destined before the foundation of the world. We are adopted into God's family. And, and we are an heir to his wealth. We're forgiven. We are resurrected and raised to new life. We are showered upon with every spiritual kindness, wisdom, and blessing. You are in Christ. You are the receivers of all this. And you as a gathered community are to declare this. But wait, there's more. 
You are to declare he's not only alive, but there's a day when all creation will bow before him as king and Lord of lords. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I, I buy into the concept. He, he will be worshipped by all creation, will bow their knee to Christ. We're part of that plan. Verse 14 of chapter 1, the sign that Christ has rescued and secured you into his family is what? Is the ring, the signet ring. You know, when you engage someone these days, you give them an engagement ring. And it's like a kind of a, an indicator, isn't it? That you're going to marry them. The signet ring is a ring of ownership and encouragement and a promise. It's actually a promise of what's coming later. And the scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a signet ring promise of all God's going to give us later. The signet ring of promise. We are to declare not just his life, but his intention to reign in the world. So the church is not a building. It's not, a, it's not an organization. It's not a business. It is a relationship with Jesus. Jesus empowered by the Spirit. The main theme, one of the main themes of this book of Ephesians is the body. And you won't get too far through the book of Ephesians before you read about the body. Stay connected to the head, which is Christ. Take care, nurture, and serve the body. Understand you are part of something bigger. You are not the fullest expression of God in this world. You know that. You need one another. We need to demonstrate Jesus alive in a community of people. The church is a gathered community declaring the risen Christ. Secondly, the church is a gifted community who carry special abilities to do God's work in the world. Thank you, Orwin, for your knitting today. I never knew you were going to come out with that, that when you knit, you pray. Isn't that cool? That is the power of knitting. <laughs> you know, it's actually the prayer behind it to the person who will receive. You are a gifted community. Chapters 4, 1 to 6, God gave gifts of people to the church, people to equip so you can do ministry for God in the world. No one person has everything. Do you know that? No one person has everything. And therefore, God has gifted the church community with all kinds of gifts and all kinds of lists of people in the scriptures. And each one of us have got something to give to make the body strong. If you have in your heart's desire this morning as you're sitting out there listening to me saying, God, why can't our church just become more alive? Why can't our church come back and be filled up with people? And why? Do you know, you are the answer to your own prayer. You are the answer when you bring what you have and put it in here. A recent survey of charities, including churches in New Zealand called Faith in Action, showed some startling trends in New Zealand. A 31% drop in people serving over the last 10 years in churches. 31% less. And of that 31%, 38% of them are serving less hours than they were in the last 10 years. Less people doing less. We've got a problem. <laughs> the church isn't mobilized. <laughs> we aren't doing the strategic plan of God. We're doing less and less people are doing less. And that's not the plan. When we don't offer what we have, the church will be weak. I was talking with someone the other day, and they were saying, you know, when you said that you wanted to do couch conversations here, you asked, I asked a person, and they said, I'm not going to do that. And then she came to me, and she said, you know, the Lord stirred my heart, and I am going to do it. That is exactly what we're talking about. Now, next week... I'm looking for someone to do a couch conversation. Who's it going to be? Who's going to put up their hand? Talk to me after the service. It's not that difficult. You could see what happens up here. It's a lot easier than doing the children's talk when you don't have a clue what's in the bag. <laughs> At least you get a chance to have a think about what you want to say. 
and you've got me beside you to rescue you and help you if you need it. Come and talk to me. We want to hear what God is saying and doing among our people, don't we? They're much better than listening to me every week. I mean, you don't know what someone's going to come up with here. We're right on the edge of something, and it could be you. Come and see me. In the scriptures, it says some were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Others are administrators. Others have gifts of mercy and care, gifts of music, gifts of healing, gifts of discernment, gifts of wisdom. Others had gifts of giving finance and hospitality and empathy and even knitting. No, it's not in the, but it is in the list, you see, because these lists are not exhaustive. Whatever you've got, give it to God and pray that he'll bless it and use it and you'll find a way forward. Now I'm going to lower a beam, get ready to duck. If you are not using the gifts God's given you, you are not part of the solution and the answer for the future of our community here. We need you. We need everyone to function in their ministry and their gifting. And we will be weak and disempowered if we don't have you. God has a strategic plan, and he's limited his plan to your obedience. The church is a gathered community. It's a gifted community. And lastly, the church is a growing. And this is my final point of part one of the message. A growing community who share a common goal and a future. There is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We grow up into Christ, the head of the church. This is what unifies the body. You know, when we look at the things that uh, uh, cause disunity in our midst, we're, we're not looking at Jesus. We're not looking at the head. We're not looking for direction. We can find plenty of things why I don't like the songs, or I don't like the musician, or I don't like this decision, or that. There's plenty of things that you might not have a preference for. But the question is, are you listening to the head, to Jesus? He is the one, he is the leader of the church and the head of the body. It's what unifies us. Don't grieve the spirit. Instead, be filled the spirit and be led by the spirit. The picture of Ephesians 4 is of a healthy body growing stronger under the direction of Jesus is the head. So the question is this, and here I'm going to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer me, but listen. Are you growing? Is Christ being formed and shaped inside you? Are the scriptures having an impact on the inside of you? What are you doing differently now that you were not doing at this time last year? Isn't that a good question? What do you see differently this year that you didn't last year? How has your insight and understanding of God changed? What about this one? What misbeliefs have you jettisoned or modified this year? Good question. I mean, we all have misbeliefs. Who's here going to say that they've got perfect theology on every topic that you can name? No one. We all believe misbelieve stuff. And we need to be challenged to come to a biblical understanding of truth. What disappointments have you grown through in the past year? Here's one. What resentments and bitternesses have you relinquished this last year? Okay. What relationships have you nurtured or curtailed? What decisions have become more transparent or accountable have you made? What prayers have you prayed have you seen answers to? Can you point to anything in your life that's changed from this year, from last year? Are you growing? <laughs> If you're, go, if you're not growing, you're dying, and you're stagnant. It's like the old bicycle. You're either going on, or you're coming off. Isn't that true with a bike? It's the same. You know, the thing is that we just don't put ourselves on the spot. It's too uncomfortable to ask those kind of questions. But it's real. And if we want God to bless and to grow our lives and encourage our church, we have to ask real questions. What did Jesus say about the people who had it all together, who thought their theology was perfect, who thought that they didn't really have anything wrong? He said, you are Pharisees. <laughs> That's what he said. 
And he had the strongest words for them. Sadly, we've learned to do church without risk. Leave church to the professionals, to the pastors. We pay them. It's their job. We've learned to do church without true community. And we've begun to run church like a business. And church is effective and we have a strategic plan and we measure our growth and development by our strategic plan. Friends, that's not church. The church is a gathered community. It's a gifted community. And it's a growing community. Part two of the book of Ephesians is what the church does. Part one is what the church is. Part two is what the church does. Very, very quickly, because I want to get on and make one point before I finish, which is going to be soon. There are four areas that we work out this faith in our lives, what the church does. It's lived out in the world, maintain the unity of the spirit with your lives in the church, maintain unity in the world with your testimony. Practice purity, spirit living in the world. The word occurs four times in connection with this word, walk well as a believer and a follower of Jesus. Walking is not spectacular as running, but walk in the spirit. It's the discipline of a daily plot. Secondly, we work this out in the church. Maintain unity in the church with one another. Use your gifting with its diversity to build up the body of Christ. Don't project your gifting onto others. Oh my goodness, how do we do this? This is one of my favorites, but I won't spend long. Do you know, sometimes people come to me and they say, our church isn't very caring, is it? I don't feel very cared for in this church. Nobody visited me. No one did anything. I was ill and no one called. And, you know, and they go on and on about what a lack of care. Do you know what that person is doing? They're saying, I am a caring person, but I project it that everyone needs to see the others like I do. <laughs> Friends, that's just not real. We must stop projecting our gifting onto one another. The carers need to care. There's no doubt about it. There's no excuse for not visiting the sick or caring for people in the church. But don't project your gift onto everybody else as though they have to see everyone just like you do. It's the same with musicians. It's the same with anything, you know. Uh, it's even the same with administration. No one can do administration like I can. Sure. Why don't you just do it and get on with it? You know? I mean, <laughs> ev oh, evangelists. Do you know who are the worst at this? Evangelists, people with the gift of evangelists, and they think everyone needs to meet out here Wednesday night, come and walk and knock on doors. Follow me. We're all going to do it. And if you don't do it, well, then you're not a true follower of Jesus. Really put the guilt stuff on you, eh? They're projecting their gift onto everyone. Don't do it. Do what God's called you to do, whatever gift you've got, and maintain unity. Okay, in the home, love and respect. Spirit-guided relationships. Fathers, love your wives or your kids. Practice selfless love in your marriage, in your relationship. In parental guidance, model it in the workplace and employment. In the spirit is the fourth area, chapter six. There is a spiritual battle that we are in. The application for us is to pick up weaponry provided by God and use it against the enemy. By the way, the use of weaponry, chapter 6 of Ephesians, is in a collective, corporate, gathered sense, not an individual. You know, we've got the old, you know, if you've got the armor of God on, let's all go out individually and let's go and fight. You fight together. And this is where prayer and encouragement and putting the armor of God on your head and your heart and your feet is so important. We fight together. And I guess, in a sense, we die together <laughs> as well. There is a serious together collective in Ephesians chapter 6. It's not an individual soldier doing his thing on his own. I need to protect your back. You need to protect mine. Okay? All right. Prayer, chapter 6. Pray in the Spirit. 
Pray for me, Paul says. Pray with persistency. Pray that we will speak boldly. Prayer is not just for those with the intercession gift. Prayer is for each of us. Hamilton Prayer Breakfast, sign up today before you leave, okay? Prayer meeting before church, 9.15 over here in this room at the back of the church. Come and pray. We need to up. I don't know, that's the wrong word. I, I don't like that word. We need to empower our prayers by being encouragers of one another and prayers together in a corporate sense. Prayer is going to be a significant part of our journey in the months ahead. Get ready for it. We need to do prayer. I think the essential message of Ephesians is don't give up on church. It's God's strategy. When Jesus rose again, one of his appearances was to disciples in the upper room. And John tells us on that occasion, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And Paul reminds us in this letter of Ephesians that this is the key to being the church of God. Receive the Spirit of God, be filled, be baptized, and be what? Is this immersed in the Spirit? Now, I'm getting back to my sponge, all right? Be immersed in the Spirit. Here goes my illustration. You know, there is a sense in which, in which we sponge, us, running around and we go, well, you know, I've had a bit of a taste of God. I, I go to church on a Sunday and I sing a few songs and give a bit of money and, oh yeah, I look at that. I am filled with the Spirit of God. I am, but do you know what? I control, now listen, this might be really for some of you. I control how much I'm giving, what I'm doing, and how much I'm immersed in the Spirit of God. Right? Is that what the Bible teaches? I don't think so. You know, because do you know what happens with this amount of water? You know what's happening? See what's happening? We leak. We leak. And that's why the scripture says, be being filled. Come back this week and pray again next week that you will be filled with the Spirit of God. And by the way, it's not like have a taste. Well, wasn't that good last Sunday? I mean, did not that good? It was lovely to be together. We had such a good time. And oh, wasn't that pastor? He preached such a good message. You know, he did such a good job. And that guy that did the children's talk, well, he was good too, you know. And we have this kind of taste of God. And it's just a taste. Do you know what the Bible says we should do? Get in it. By the way, that's what baptism is, and it's about time we had one. Isn't it? Yeah. Who hasn't been baptized? I'm ready to go. All right? Um, okay. But this is the picture of the fullness and the baptism of the Spirit. Those of you that are so worried about that term, baptism of the Spirit, get over yourselves, for goodness sake. Do you know what it means? It means be immersed in the Spirit. That's what it means. It means be covered by Get under there and let the Spirit of God breathe into you every bit of you and don't try to control the outcome. That's what it means. Okay, be immersed in the Spirit and then come back next week and be immersed again. There is plenty of immersion experiences and baptisms of the Spirit. Now, you might have a remarkable experience the first time you experience the, the baptism of the Spirit. That's fine. You might receive gifts from God. You might have prophetic words. But you know what? You'll need to come back again because you leak <laughs> and you need to have it again and again. Be baptized in the Spirit and be filled you know, we've had so many years where we've been so good at doing strategic plans in church. Do you know what the great lack in our churches is? It's a culture of Jesus. If I was to pass the microphone right now to Peter Foster, he would just preach a word right now, right on the end of my statement, because this last week we talked about kingdom culture in our churches. And the fact that we've turned our churches into little businesses... And we've set strategic plans and dreams and measured stuff and all that. But do you know what? Do you know what the great lack is? Kingdom culture of Jesus. It's the kingdom culture of being immersed in the Spirit and a little bit careless about what you say and do because you're filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll do spirit filled things. Okay, so don't worry too much about that. What is the king culture? of Hamilton Central Baptist Church? Is it a culture of freedom or judgment? Ouch. 
Is it a culture of generosity or stinginess? Is it a culture of forgiveness or a culture of offense? Is it a culture of grace or a culture of the rules? There are rules around here and don't you dare break them. No. Is it a Jesus culture or a club culture? Now they're hard questions. But we must ask them. Because it's so easy to be offended or to be judgmental or to be unforgiving or to live by the rules and not by freedom and grace and forgiveness and love, 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 love the body of Christ. A culture of a kingdom culture. So today, when you leave this building or when you leave the end of the service and go to the cafe, I don't want people saying, oh, wasn't that a good sermon? Wasn't that a good sermon? I want you to say, what is the culture of our church? I want you to ask yourself, are you a more offending or forgiving person than you were last year? What is the culture of our church? Are we generous? Is there room to grow? Are we graceful? Are we, are we free people? Or are we all bound up? You know, I see sometimes, and I try not to be judgmental, but I try to see sometimes people singing and they're going, you know, you know when, you're, when you're immersed in the spirit, you don't care about what people think of you. You are worshiping God with the family. There's a freedom in that. There are two things that we need to do to develop this culture of the kingdom. We need to be immersed in the spirit. There's the sponge. He still needs immersing. And we need to be connected to one another. I just want to close by asking you whether you really are immersed in the spirit. Are you baptized in the spirit of God? Or do we need to come again and experience that again? I'm sure we do. We all do. When we're immersed in the spirit, we will relinquish our pet offenses and disappointments. We'll let go of our preferences and our need for approval. We will choose to obey Jesus and we can't control the outcome. Have you soaked up Christ so that he is in you and you are in him? Now, back to my knitting, just to finish. I'm not very good at knitting. I did three stitches while Orwin was up here. But I can do purl. I know that's how you do it when you push it through the back way. That's all I know, something to do with going the other way, backwards. But you know, I do know this about knitting. A piece of wool on its own, easily broken. If you are a piece of wool, on your own, you go, well, Jesus and me, we can do anything. You know, we can, you know we're, we're buddies. We're, you're easily broken. If you are knitted together into the family of God, there is serious strength in a piece of knitting. It could be used as a tow rope because you are knit together in love. And that, friends, is the picture of Ephesians. Don't think you're okay when you're on your own. Be knit together into the family of God. When you are on your own, you are a target for Satan to pick off. Together we stand. And that is the sense in which the book of Ephesians says, be connected to God and to one another. Okay, I'm going to do something to finish on the piano. And there's a reason for this. And it's a piece of music which uses only the white keys. Now, going way back here, this is a long way back. Okay, I'm only going to use the white keys, and I'm only going to use the ones in the middle. Oh, I need to put headphones on so I can hear. Otherwise, I can't. Okay. Okay, you ready? This is a piece of music that you know. They are weak, but he is strong. 
Now, I used only white keys. I used the keys that were in the center of the keyboard. And if our church was a keyboard, there are some people that get used a lot. They're in the middle of the keyboard, and in a piece of music like Yes, Jesus Loves Me in the key of C, they get lots of use. Sometimes we look at the people in the church and we go, oh, man, they do such a good job. I would never do anything like that. But my question to you guys this morning is, what about, what about all those keys? When did they ever get a chance to do their thing? Now, what about the black notes? Now, those of you that are kind of a little bit black, <laughs> colored, whatever word we use, You know, there's a way to play where you bring the black notes in and it brings color and vibrancy and life and beauty. And you go, if only our church could be like. Black notes. Okay, so, you know, the, the people, no, <laughs> the people, the notes down here, or up here, they've got to be ready to play. You might not get used that often. You might not think, well, I'm not needed around here, but your note has got to be ready to play. And the other thing we've got to do is we've got to play the black notes with the white notes. And remember the note down there? Okay, so that's my illustration, guys. And I just want us to remember we're all needed. If you're, if you're a note way down there or way up there, get ready to play. Get ready to play. There comes a time when the conductor goes, you're on, I need you. If you're a black note and you think, well, I don't get used very much, get ready to participate. Because, yes, Jesus loves me, needs all the keys of the kingdom, of the family of God to play well. Let's pray together. Before we do, I want to just put this up. Um, no, we won't. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you that you gifted your church in an amazing way, that we are a family. We, we all have something to give. Forgive us, Lord, that we've withdrawn and pulled back and we've watched others and we've even judged them. And we realize, Lord, that instead we need to contribute. We need to be part of the solution. We need to be immersed into the Spirit completely and utterly and fully so that we can express and declare the great message of Jesus. For this is the why of the church. And for that, Lord, we're grateful. Amen. Remember in the cafe, talk about the culture. Talk about Jesus. Talk about what will change our church culture. Talk about what we need to do to bring a positive future into our church family. We're going to close our service with communion this morning. Next week it's Philippians, yes. No, actually it's not. No. No. My mistake. I'm going to interview someone next week. I've got a very special person who I will... We'll do it together, he and I. You won't want to miss next week. The man that I'm, is coming to speak is what I believe a modern-day apostle. Now, I know that word's got a lot of bad connotations in New Zealand. Here's a man who heard God's call years ago in England... 
and went out to a tribe in Africa and started from nothing and preached the gospel and planted a church. That's an apostle. He's coming here next Sunday. And I'm going to ask him to reflect on his life and to tell us why Ephesians matters. So we're going to, we're going to flick back a little bit to today's message, but you're going to hear a modern-day example of the book of Ephesians. You won't want to miss it. And then the following week will be Philippians. Father God, thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his obedience. Thank you that he gave of himself and his life that we might live, that we might declare the greatness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Thank you that as we gather now, we are here because we are your people, your church. We are here as we take this bread and this cup to declare the risen Christ in our midst. Help us to do that well, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. We'll receive a piece of bread as a symbol of the body. This is my cup. This is my blood shed for you. As often as you drink it, remember me, what? And my kingdom, kingdom culture. Did the disciples have any idea what it was about? <laughs> I mean, thank you. these guys are saying, can I sit on your left or right hand when you come in your kingdom? Who's the greatest? What are you going to do? Let's chop off someone's ear if they, you know, I mean, these guys didn't have a clue what's going on. And Jesus just marches forward into this incredible cost. And he leaves it in the hands of these 12 guys and their wives and family and kids. We often don't hear about them, do we? And they become the first expression of the body of Christ. Well, here we are, years later. I'm going to invite you forward. I'd like you to come and take a bread and a, and a cup, then go back to your seat, and then we will stand and we will eat and drink together today as a symbol of our unity. Would you do that now? Come forward and receive, please. Thank you.